name is Robert Stern and I'm Professor of Philosophy at the University of Sheffield. I've worked on Kant's philosophy for many years and published various books and papers on his ethics. I also recently published a new co-translation of his Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals, which is the text I will be discussing in these talks, and I will be quoting from this translation. My overall aim is to give you some guidance in understanding what Kant is trying to do in this short but complex philosophical masterpiece. The first talk will focus on the question, how does Kant derive his supreme principle of morality from the idea of a good will? The second talk will look at how he derives that same principle from the idea of categorical imperatives, and also how he formulates the principle in different ways. But to begin with, I want to say something more general about what Kant is trying to do in the groundwork and about the book itself to put both these issues in context. The book is divided into three sections and based around the two things Kant says in the preface that he is trying to do in this text, where he writes, the present groundwork is nothing more than the identification and vindication of the supreme principle of morality. So the groundwork aims firstly to identify the supreme principle of morality and then secondly to vindicate or defend it, to show that it is not a delusion or a chimerical idea as he puts it later. The first two sections of the groundwork deal with the first identificatory task and the last section deals with the second vindicatory one. While section three of the groundwork is fascinating, it is also famously difficult so I won't be able to say anything more about it in these short talks. I will focus just on sections one and two, and thus on Kant's identificatory task. So Kant is setting out to identify the supreme principle of morality, that is the principle that governs the whole of morality. He does not actually say why it is worth finding such a principle, but he probably thought he could take this for granted. For without such a principle, morality would be an unconnected mess. But Kant assumes it isn't a mess, which is why it makes sense to look for the principle that underlies it and which underpins all our moral thinking. Now, Kant isn't the first to try to find such a principle and others have tried since, most notably perhaps utilitarianism, which in Jeremy Bentham's version says that, quote, it is the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong." End quote. As we shall see, Kant gives a different answer, his so-called categorical imperative, which comes in different formulations, raising the question whether Kant produces one supreme principle at all, or many. But before we get on to that in the next talk, we need to see how he conducts his search for the principle and what role his account of the goodwill plays in the process. To see this, we can begin by asking, if you wanted to identify a supreme principle of morality, how would you do it? One option would be to start from a bunch of things we already know are morally right and try to find some principle that underlies them. But the problem with this approach is that this already assumes you know what is morally right. But until you have identified the supreme principle of morality, you can't be sure you are correct. Another option might be to find some moral exemplar. Kant mentions the Holy One of the Gospel, i.e. Jesus, but you could think of some other obviously good person, like David Attenborough, say, and ask what principle they would use, as in the question, what would Jesus do? Or maybe, what would David Attenborough do? But again, this approach already assumes we know the supreme principle in order to identify who is a moral exemplar in this way and judge them accordingly. So instead, Kant adopts a third approach, which doesn't start by assuming any such principle to say which actions are good or which particular person is good. Rather, this approach just starts from the idea of the good will itself, 
just from the idea of the will of a good person or agent as such, and then tries to determine what principle such a good will would follow. So now we don't have to assume the supreme principle to decide what is a good action or who is a good person. We just start from the very idea of a good-willed agent and work from there to see what principle they would use to guide their actions. And that will be the supreme principle we are looking for. So now, what can we say about a good will? Here is what Kant says. Firstly, it is unconditionally good, by which he means that the good will is always good, unlike, for example, character traits, where bravery might be good in a soldier, but bad in a thief. Secondly, this means its goodness does not depend on actually accomplishing its ends. So, for example, Nelson Mandela would still have been good, even if he had not managed to bring down apartheid in South Africa. Thirdly, the role of reason in such a will is not to help us satisfy our desires, as instinct could have done this just as well, as it does in animals who don't have reason. Fourthly, in human beings a good will is a dutiful will, because we often don't want to do what is good, and so we experience the good as something we ought to do, and hence as an obligation or duty. So now, given the last point, Kant focuses on not just the good will, but the dutiful will, to see if from that we can say anything about the principle on which such a will would act. To do this, Kant puts forward three propositions about a dutiful will, although unfortunately he only numbers the last two, but not the first one. The first proposition is that a properly dutiful and hence good will does not merely conform to duties in its actions, but acts from duty. For, Kant argues, a person might conform to duty, that is, do what duty requires, out of an inclination, but this is not enough to make them good, dutiful agents. Kant thinks this is obviously the case when the inclination is clearly self-interested. For example, when a shopkeeper treats his customers honestly and so conforms to the duty to be honest, but does it because he knows that this way his customers are more likely to come back. So his motivation here is self-interest rather than knowing he should not cheat his customers and hence acting on that as his duty. So he is not really a good person, even though he does the right thing. More controversially, Kant also thinks that someone who acts well towards others not out of self-interest, but out of what he calls sympathetic concern, is likewise not a properly good person. Instead, Kant says, in fact it is the person who does not feel such concern, and who maybe even feels rather cold and indifferent towards their suffering, but who still helps them out of a sense of duty, who is really good. For Kant says, quote, this is precisely where the worth of character arises, which is moral and beyond all comparison the highest, namely being beneficent not from inclination, but from duty, end quote. Kant thus thinks he has established his first proposition, that goodness consists in acting from duty and not merely in conformity with it. Kant then moves on to his second proposition, which he states as follows. An action done from duty has its moral worth not in the purpose that is attained by it, but rather according to the maxim according to which it is decided upon. Kant is saying here that, as he has already argued, moral worth does not come from what we actually manage to achieve. For Nelson Mandela's actions would have had great moral worth even if they had managed to accomplish nothing. So their worth must come from the maxim or principle of willing that governed them, such as, I will end apartheid. And that principle cannot be one that the agent adopts in order to satisfy their desires, 
because then they would be acting out of inclination and not duty. And we saw from the first proposition that a good agent does not act out of inclination. Kant thus argues here that the principle on which the good agent acts must therefore be formal, not material. That is, it does not tell you how to satisfy desires and you won't adopt it for that reason. For example, I might adopt the principle always have a coffee with breakfast because I desire to be woken up. But that can't be a moral principle as the only reason to adopt it is to satisfy my desire to be woken up. So as moral actions cannot be motivated by desires, the first proposition, then moral principles cannot be principles which we follow in order to satisfy our desires, the second proposition. But then you may ask, if we don't follow these principles because doing so would satisfy our desires, why do we follow them? What could motivate us here if not our desires? Kant's response to this question leads him to his third proposition. We follow them because we are motivated by respect. This is a very interesting idea for him to use at this point because he's excluded inclination or desires as a motivation for a dutiful agent, but he needs something to motivate such agents, where on the one hand respect is something that can motivate us, and on the other hand it is not a desire or inclination. But then Kant asks, what kind of principle might a dutiful agent feel respect for? It can't be for a principle that tells them how to satisfy their desires, as then they would feel a desire to follow that principle, rather than respect. Instead, the principle must be a formal principle, which governs them regardless of their desires. So it must be a law, where laws hold regardless of our desires, but are nonetheless things we can respect and be motivated to follow as a result. Kant thus arrives at his third proposition. Duty is necessity of an action out of respect for the law. OK, so now we have Kant's three propositions concerning dutiful agents. Firstly, they act out of duty, not just in conformity with duty. Secondly, these duties are formal principles which they do not act on to satisfy their desires. Therefore, thirdly, these duties are laws that they act on out of respect. Finally then, what supreme principle will these dutiful agents use to govern their actions and use to decide how they should act? Well, we know that they are motivated out of respect for laws. So the principle they will adopt must be one that tells them to see if the principle they are planning to act on could be a law, where a law is something that holds necessarily and universally. So that is what this dutiful agent will do. She will test her principles for action or maxims to see if they could hold as laws, namely a principle that could hold not just if she acted on it, but if everyone did, because laws hold not just for individuals, but generally. So this is the supreme principle of morality that Kant says he has now identified. I ought never to proceed except in such a way that I could also will my maxim become a universal law. He then concludes section one by giving one illustration of how this would work. Namely, suppose you are wondering if you should make a false promise to someone which would benefit you greatly. For example, you promise that if they lend you some money, you will pay them back, knowing full well you won't. Should you do it? Is this false promising a moral maxim? Clearly not, Kant argues, because it could not become a universal law, as if we all made lying promises, no one would believe anyone and so the very practice of promising would collapse. Hence, he says, my maxim, as soon as it were made universal law, would necessarily destroy itself." End quote. Kant has thus provided us with one route to identifying the supreme principle of morality and telling us what it is, by starting from the idea of the goodwill, 
and this covers what he does in section 1 of the groundwork. In the next talk, we will consider why he complicates the picture somewhat in section 2 in offering a different route to the supreme principle and providing different formulations of it. Thank you.